Hi teachers, my name is Sarah Smith. Welcome to Lead to Teach and welcome to part two of We're Engaged. I'm so excited for today's session. And I know what you're gonna say. You're gonna say, Sarah, you say that about every session and that is true, I do. <laughs> but I really am excited for this one because, spoiler, we're gonna talk about partner talk. And partner talk is one of those strategies that is so effective and I've been thinking about as an instructional coach, when I go visit other teachers' classrooms and do a guest lesson for them, one of the pieces that makes it hardest to do that effectively is if teachers don't have a strong partner routine in place. Because then I have to just rely on choral responding as my form of student engagement. And I've decided that that's a little bit like giving kids a meal of dehydrated food. It's still nutrient dense. It's still going to give us what we need but it's not as enjoyable as fresh food. And that's what I would compare partner talk to. All of a sudden now the meal is still nutrient dense, but it's also so much more palatable and enjoyable than that dehydrated food. So I'm hoping we can recall that effective teachers are effective because they attend to the big five, right? We've talked about that a lot. The last of those big five effective strategies being that teachers engage students effectively. So can we just recall what engagement means? As a definition, engagement is just a strategy that invites all of our students to participate during instruction. So just like this school of fish moves together through the ocean to arrive at a desired destination at the same time, we mimic that idea in our classroom with engagement and we say, I'm gonna move all my kids together through this sea of content so that we all arrive at our learning target at the same time, as much as possible, right? I don't want any kids left out and not knowing what's going on. Another way of saying that is to say everyone in my classroom will say it, everyone will show it, or everyone will write it. I'm, I'm not calling on single students with hands raised one at a time. Everyone will do everything. Um, so there's two parts to say it. Choral response is the one we talked about last time, and then partner talk being the one we'll talk about today. Okay, so there's two parts in that within that say it category. And can we just review quickly that choral response is when you have all students respond in unison, and you do that for two reasons. One, to either emphasize new or key ideas, do you remember that? Or in order to express or acquire understanding. So your high kids are expressing the understanding they already have. Your low kids are acquiring understanding that they don't yet have. So uh, for example, in the word habitat, if this is a new word, I absolutely want all my kids saying that. This word is habitat. Say it, habitat. Clap habitat, ready? Habitat. Habitat means the place where something lives. Um, and that, that phrase right there may not be new to kids in terms of language, but is it key to their understanding? Yeah, if it's key to their understanding of habitat, then they also need to be saying that, right? We talked about that phrase, miles on the tongue. So um, I might then do a choral response around this and say, you're going to echo me my turn first. Habitat means, habitat means the place where something lives, the place where something lives. And I'm going to go through some examples. I'm going to show pictures um, before I shift over to partner talk. Partner talk now is when we have all students discuss in pairs the new or key ideas that we're talking about. So I'm not just going to echo new and key terminology. I'm going to actually have a discussion about the new or key ideas in order to deepen understanding. And that is true for our advanced students, it's true for our struggling students, that regardless of the knowledge you come to, uh, come to the topic with, you're going to deepen the understanding around that topic. So if we're talking about habitats and we've talked a little bit about what that means and given some examples, a partner talk question might be, what would be difficult about living in a desert habitat? That's going to deepen understanding for all of my kids regardless of ability level. Okay, so we're looking at verbal engagement strategies, but not the choral responding, the partner talk today. And can we just talk about the why behind it? In this video, I'm just gonna show you a clip of this right now. I'll show you the whole sequence later. But in this clip, would you just be thinking for a second, what might be the advantages of having your students respond in pairs? Would you, would you think about that in this first grade example? What did you notice was the same in off stuff, sniff, fill, shell, doll, pass, boss, less. Were there some things you noticed the same about those words, about the letters in those words? Um, 
You're only allowed to say one thing at a time that you might have noticed because then it will be your partner's turn. But if you notice something, do it quietly so others don't take your answers. Letter B's, tell your partners. Letter A's for my groups of three. Go. Okay, so you probably arrived at some of these. I'm going to talk about five wins with partner talk. Win number one would be that all students have the opportunity to participate. Another way of saying that is I create accountability for everyone. Uh, the research is pretty substantial in showing that it's most effective to have students discuss ideas in pairs, more effective than trios or teams where kids tend to shy away and just let one person sort of carry the load for everyone. So I create accountability when all students are talking in pairs because you're either talking or you're listening. To me, it's kind of like tennis when both people are accountable the entire game. Everybody has a role the entire game. Okay, win number two would be that when you do partner talk, it decreases downtime within the lesson. Why? Because I'm not calling on one single kid and letting one single kid answer while 99 do not. Anytime I can decrease downtime, you're going to see a reduction in disruptions. So the idea is that as you increase partner talk opportunities, you decrease downtime and therefore disruptions. Okay, win number three, I love this one, is that partner talk extends understanding for your advanced students, right? I already understood something about the topic and now I'm going to extend that understanding, but it also solidifies ideas for your struggling students. Guess what this is called? Differentiation. Anytime I have teachers who tell me that they just really wanna work on differentiating for their students, then I say, okay, then we need to look at engagement. Choral response and partner talk, those are the two easiest ways to differentiate instruction without having to go home and prepare two separate curricula for your high kids and your low kids. I compare it to this fruit platter that regardless of, of what you pick off this platter, it's going to be nutrient dense. It's going to give you something that is good for you. Um, differentiation. Okay, win number four is that partner talk always adds variety and interest to learning. Um, when you tell kids, in just a second, you're going to talk to your partner about, <laughs> it's so interesting because if partner talk is done well in a classroom, you immediately see the kids start like anticipating that and they start like kind of fidgeting and they might look at each other and they, they lean in closer to hear the question. They are so eager to talk about these ideas. So that's called an increase in motivation, right? I'm now more motivated to learn this content because I know I'm going to get to discuss it and deepen my understanding about it. I compare it to the golden retrievers that we had growing up when I was a kid. If you would say the word walk, or if you would say the word leash, <laughs> we had two golden retrievers, they would freak out. They would start running in circles. They would wag their tails. They would bark. Like they were just so excited about the idea of going on a walk. And that's what I feel like kids do when you tell them they're going to get to talk about an idea with a partner. Okay, then win number five is that partner talk further develops oral language abilities. Um, and this one could be a whole session in and of itself, but basically here's what we know from the research is that reading comprehension is the product of two components, word recognition ability, right? Decoding and also language ability. So when I further develop oral language abilities, I'm targeting one of the two sides of that reading coin, of that reading comprehension coin, which is really, really valuable, that I can increase reading comprehension just by focusing on oral language abilities. Pretty cool, huh? Okay, so let's talk about then the how of doing partner talk most effectively. Um, before you do partner talk, you're going to want to precision pair your students according to ability. So this is how I've heard it explained uh, from Kevin Feldman, who's really well known for partner talk is that you have students that are a one, a two, or a three. A one would be your lowest student, a two would be a typically performing student, and a three would be your more advanced students. And then what you do is you say, okay, as, as much as I can, I'm going to pair my one and my twos together, my two and my threes together. And, you know, if behaviorally some of those pairings don't work out, then you could pair threes with threes or twos with twos. But the pairings you would want to avoid are ones and threes, you don't want to pair your lowest kids with your most advanced kids because that tends to create frustration for both groups. And you don't want to pair ones with ones if you can avoid it um, or, or unless they're sitting right there in front of you and you can kind of monitor and intervene during the conversation. Um, as often as possible, precision pairing looks like pairing kids with one level down or one level up. 
uh, okay, so after you've precision paired your students, and I should have said too, behavior trumps all. Do you know that? If I have two kids that, that don't get along or that are going to make each other escalate in disruptions, but they're perfectly paired in terms of ability, no, I'm not gonna do that pairing. Behavior will trump everything because I don't wanna create disruptions by my pairings. So, so let me go back. This would be ideal if you could do it this way, ones with twos, twos with threes, but uh, also attend to those behavioral needs first. Okay. Once you've done that, then you want to put the following six components into place. Ready? The first one is the longest one. And that is that you want to ask an open-ended question. Why? Because recall that this is where students are going to discuss ideas. So it has to be an open-ended question that invites um, a variety of responses. I love Who loves Calvin and Hobbes as much as I do? I love Calvin and Hobbes. Um, <laughs> here Calvin is saying to Hobbes, I tell you Hobbes, it's great to have a friend who appreciates an earnest discussion of ideas. And I feel like they were talking about bugs or mud or something fun like that. So cute. Um, but an open-ended question is a question that will invite a multi-word explanation. So not a yes or no, thumbs up or down question. I was in a classroom a couple years ago where the teacher um, had been reading a text with the second graders and said to the kids, so do you think the farmer was sad? Turn and tell your partner, do you think the farmer was sad? And this is what happened is almost every single kid in the classroom turned to their partner and went, yes, because it was so obvious that the farmer was sad. <laughs> a better question would be an open-ended one that invites a multi-word response like, will you tell your partner why you think the farmer was sad? Because there had been four or five things leading up to that point that made the farmer sad that would have been a good opportunity for discussion, not a thumbs up or down. So can we do a little bit of um, distinction practice? Which category would these fall into? C for choral response or P for partner talk? First one, which word means the place where something lives? Is that a single word response or a multi-word response? That would be single word, so I'm just going to do choral response for that one. Um, which word means the place where something lives? Think about it, it's called a Habitat, you got it, it's a habitat. Okay, would you rather visit a rainforest or the safari? What would you rather visit? Okay, well that can be multi-word, right? Especially if I say, tell your partner and say, because, so that's a good partner talk question. Which digraph says k after a short vowel? And again, I'm thinking, is this like a single word or short word response or multi-word response? That's gonna be a single word response. So that's just a choral response opportunity. Which digraph says k after a short vowel? It's called digraph CK. You got it, digraph CK. Uh, but what if I did this? Why should I use digraph CK at the end of this word? Why should I do that? All of a sudden now that is a good partner talk question because there's more than one um, reason for that, more than one word. Okay, next page of practice. Who is someone you admire and why? Obviously that's multi-word, so that's gonna be a good partner talk. What about in math, if you purposely make a mistake as the teacher and then say, what did I do wrong in this problem? Can you describe what I did wrong? Again, that's multi-word, so that's a good partner talk question. But is six plus seven a doubles plus one fact? Probably is not a good partner talk question because that's a yes or no, or that's a quick answer, right? Is six plus seven a doubles plus one fact? Are six and seven number neighbors? Yep. So that's a choral response. Uh, what about the read aloud? Suppose you're reading The Princess and the Pea with your kids. Um, some teachers might be tempted to ask, what do you think will happen to the princess? What do you, th what do you think will happen um, when the queen puts the pea under her mattresses? And they're probably all going to say, she's going to feel it because they know she's a real princess. Um, a better question might be, what do you think will happen when the queen realizes the girl is a princess? Ooh, because now there's lots of different ways that that answer could go, right? Maybe the queen will embrace her and welcome her as her new daughter-in-law. Maybe the queen will be upset with her. Maybe the queen will give her another test. So even though this is a good partner talk question, even though both of these are partner talk questions, one is better than the other. Okay, so I was going to call this a quick tip, but I'm going to call it a crucial tip instead <laughs> because I've seen it not done in so many classrooms and then I've seen that this is the component that can make partner talk fall apart. So the crucial tip would be that you give students a sentence stem to begin the discussion, that you give them something to start with. 
So let's take these good partner talk questions and, and turn them into sentence stems, can we? Would you rather visit a rainforest or the safari? You're going to say, I would rather visit, hmm, because, and what is so funny is you'll hear all the kids start the same way. Like when you say, talk to your partner, go, they will say, I would rather visit, uh, like they all start the same way and then it just diverges into a hundred different directions and it's, it's really fun to watch. Okay, why should I use CK at the end of this word? You're going to say, you should use CK because, um, who is someone you admire and why? You're going to say, I admire, hmm, because, and let me just pause right here and say, that the reason it's so important for kids to be able to speak and complete sentences is because Kate Kinsella is really famous for popularizing the statement that if they can speak it, they can write it. If we want our kids to write incomplete sentences, they have to first be able to speak incomplete sentences. So that's partially why this is so valuable and it gets them talking about the topic they're supposed to. Okay, uh, in math, what did I do wrong in this problem? You're going to say, the mistake she made was... And then last one, what do you think will happen when the queen realizes that the girl is a princess? You're going to say, maybe the queen will, or the queen might, and you know, choose which sentence stem works for you, but giving them a sentence stem will make them much more likely to be successful during partner talk. Okay, so that was number one, ask an open-ended question with a sentence stem. Number two is that you want to assign who goes first. So if I have an even number of kids in my classroom, I'm going to assign one of those kids to be the A, one of those kids to be the B within that pairing. Um, if you have an odd number of kids in your class, then you'll have a trio of an A, B, C, right? And this is what I often see it look like in a classroom is that uh, the teacher will just move a magnet underneath the letter to, to tell who is supposed to go first. So uh, what do you think the queen will do when she realizes that the girl is a princess? Letter A's go first in my trio letter B's. Um, so we want to assign who goes first. If we don't assign this, do you know what happens instead? Two things, either uh, one of the kids will dominate the partner talk or they will argue about whose turn it is to go first. <laughs> I've seen this over and over and over again that they either dominate or argue, but they never just sit back and say, why don't you go first? I'd like to listen to you. Quick tip is, I, I would suggest against telling partners when to switch. I think it's really, really important to tell them who goes first, letter A's go first. This time letter B's go first and to alternate back and forth taking turns who starts. But it doesn't seem to work so well to say, uh, listen for me to tell you when to switch so that the other person can answer because some kids get done talking more quickly than others. Um, and, and because they finish at varying rates, then you end up either with downtime as kids wait for the teacher to tell them to switch or you end up cutting some kids off. So I think it works best to just train your kids who talks first and to let them automatically switch when, um, when the first person has had a chance to share their idea. Okay, third one then, after we've asked an open-ended question and assigned who goes first is that we're always going to require that students use a low voice. Um, I would define that not as a six inch whisper, not as a 12 inch whisper or your inside voice or a level two voice. I've, I've heard all of those, but I think those are kind of abstract for kids. It tends to be most successful if you just say, you're going to talk to your partner in a low voice. That means only your partner should be able to hear you. They're the only one who should hear what you're saying. You should not be disturbing the other pairs of kids in the classroom. You may have seen this, the four L's of productive partners. So it's look at your partner's eyes, lean toward your partner, lower your voice, and listen attentively. Here's the great news, ready? Is that I have found just by requiring that kids lower their voice, you get these other three behaviors for free. They tend to look at each other, they tend to lean toward, they tend to listen attentively just by virtue of their partner talking in a low voice. So who doesn't love when you get bonus free behaviors without training? <laughs> Um, not requiring a low step is the fastest way to cause teacher burnout. This is the number one reason I see teachers shying away from partner talk is because it gets too noisy. So it might seem simple, but it's an important step. Okay, how do you train your kids to use a low voice? And the answer, of course, is tempo. Do you remember that from this is how we train any new behavioral expectation? 
So I'm going to tell you the task. I'm going to explain how it looks and sounds. I'm going to model it. We're going to practice together and I'm going to offer you feedback as we practice. And you'll see this in a video in a minute, like a setting up partners practice. So I won't say too much about that, but that is how you get them to use a low voice is to practice it. Okay, then fourth is you want to have a we're done signal within the partner talk. Uh, my favorite is that you just tell the kids when you're done talking about the idea, when you've answered the question, you're going to sit with arms on top of your table or desk and your eyes on me. That's how I'll know you're done. Um, why would you want students to show you when they're done talking? You're not surprised that it's so that they quit talking. <laughs> That's number one. And so that you as the teacher know they're done. So there's some sort of signal for you to know when to move on. Um, the fifth component of partner talk is related to the fourth. So you want a we're done signal for kids to show you when they're done talking. But it's also really important to have a you're done signal from the teacher uh, when you tell the kids that it's time to stop talking, even if you're not done. My favorite one is to say, okay, time's up in three, two, one, and done. And to bring the kids back together. Why would you want to signal to students that it's time to stop talking the answer, of course, is so that they stop talking. Who loves Ivy and Bean? Do you love this chapter book series? If you don't, you need to like find out about it. I love this chapter book series. Um, Bean is just this wild woman. <laughs> She's so talkative. She's a hundred miles a minute. And Ivy is so oh, sweet and mild mannered and gentle and quiet and rule following. And I think these two kids may be a great pair for partner talk, right? That may be a great way to pair your students, but if you don't ever have a you're done signal, I tell you what, Bean will talk until the end of eternity. So it's important to have that you're done signal for kids that are like that in your classroom. When do you give the signal? When do you tell kids that they're done talking? And the answer is when 80% are done, right? 80% is always that sweet spot in whole group instruction. Uh, if I tell the kids to stop talking when 50% of, of them are showing me the we're done signal, oh, that's too cold. If I wait for 100% of kids to be done, that's too hot, especially if I've got kids like Bean in my classroom. So I'm waiting for 80% for most of my kids to be showing me that they're done before I call them back together. What do you do with students who are done talking? Um, I sometimes get pushback on this, but, but here's my recommendation quick affirmations that as kids are showing you that they're done, you're just giving them a thumbs up. You're giving them a nod. You're giving them a thanks for showing me you're done. You're just doing quick connections. It's a quick opportunity for relationship building and it's better than just sitting there with nothing to do. Um, that, that would be my recommendation. Okay. Then the question uh, that I also very often hear teachers ask is, but how do I make sure that my kids actually become quiet? at my signal. Like I can say three, two, one, we're done, but how do I make sure that they actually become quiet? And the answer is through a stick contingency. I'm going to draw a stick for kids to share out and kids who are sitting ready will get a chance to share out. And because kids want a chance to share out, especially in grades K-1-2, they become quiet very quickly if they know that they only get to share out if they're showing you that they're ready. Um, so I stole this idea from a teacher last year she takes an empty toilet paper roll and puts it inside her stick container. She just puts a little dab of hot glue on the side and then all the sticks start inside the toilet paper roll and she just pulls them out as they're drawn to ensure that all the kids have equal turns. Is that brilliant? I love that so much. <laughs> Thank you to that teacher. Wow. Okay, then the last step, number six, is related to the fifth right? Um, I'm going to have a you're done signal and then I'm going to draw sticks to share out. So this is what this might sound like is, okay, time's up in three, two, one, and done. If this person is sitting ready, my stick says, and this is how you're going to get kids to go quickly, um, is how, how quickly you give the we're done signal and state the contingency for the person being able to share out. I worked with a teacher a few years ago who had a beautiful partner talk routine in place in her classroom. She was asking open-ended questions. Um, the kids were using low voices. She was assigning who was going first. They had a weird done signal. She had her your done signal, but then the kids would just keep talking. And, and she asked me to just look at the, the routine and see if I could figure out like what, what's going wrong? Why is it falling apart every time at the end? 
And it was because there was an average of an eight second delay between when she said time's up in three, two, one, and done. And then she would wait for an average of eight seconds for everybody to become quiet, which then places control on the kids and not with the teacher, right? So what we did is said, can we just institute a zero second delay? So you're going to say time's up in three, two, one, and done. If this person is sitting ready, my stick says, and there's a zero second delay between when you give the signal and when you tell kids you're drawing a stick. And guess what? It worked beautifully. It was like one of those happily ever after moments. Here's what research tells us, especially uh, related to stick drawing, okay? Is I have observed classrooms in countless schools and what I see are teachers routinely calling on students with their hands raised. A dead giveaway that teachers don't understand the essence of a good lesson. In other words, if I'm calling on kids who have their hands raised, those are my kids who already know the ideas and the content, who have probably the strongest oral language skills, who have the best problem solving skills. When I call on those kids who have their hands raised, that's the rich get richer and everyone else gets left behind. So I'm not doing that. I'm not calling on kids with their hands raised. I'm going to draw sticks and let kids share out. And then what would, be, what would be the benefit of that, of drawing sticks for kids to share out after a partner talk? Well, again, it creates that accountability, right? Your stick might be drawn. Um, I remember just last year I was in a conference for teachers and there were probably hmm, three, 300 of us in the auditorium and we were supposed to talk about something in pairs and the presenter said, and then I have two people with microphones who will come around and randomly ask some of you to share your ideas. <laughs> And you better believe that I was really careful to actually talk about the topic with my partner to come up with something that would sound coherent and intelligent in case I was chosen to share out in front of this group of people via microphone. So the same is true for our kids. We want to create accountability for them. What's another benefit of stick drawing and having kids share out? Well, it allows peers to teach each other. I get to hear this idea from somebody my age and not just from the teacher. And then of course last is that it gives the teacher a chance to assess. It gives me as the teacher a chance to say, how well are my students understanding this idea? Um, another, what I was going to call quick tip is now a crucial tip is that your role during the share out portion of the lesson as the teacher is to either repeat the student's idea, to clarify the student's idea, or to extend the student's idea. I can't tell you how many times I've been in a classroom and a teacher will draw sticks to share out and the kids will say something and the teacher will go, uh-huh, draw another stick. That's right, another stick. Oh, not quite, let's draw another stick. Oh, good job. And I'm sitting back there going, I have no idea what the kids are saying because they tend to talk kind of softly and I have no idea um, what's, what's being said by them. So at the very least, you always want to repeat what the student has said, but we can also clarify and extend as there's time. So quick example. Teacher says, what would be difficult about living in a desert habitat? And the student says, it's hot. You draw their stick, they say it's hot. Well, if you're going to repeat that, you could just say, right, the desert is hot. And I'm saying that loudly and clearly enough for everybody to know that that is what was said. I could clarify that idea by saying, okay, it's hot. And you think being hot would make someone miserable? Okay, good. Or I could extend that idea. The student says it's hot and I could say, right. And when you're hot, you're more thirsty. Oh, so now there's two problems, huh? And guess what the student's always going to do? Mm -hmm. they're, they're always going to nod like, yep, that's where I was going. <laughs> um, but we're always extending student answers or clarifying or repeating. We're doing something herein. We're not just affirming, mm -hmm, good job. Or that's beautiful. That, that's still too vague, too generic. Teacher sometimes asks, so how many sticks do I draw? And the answer is, enough to solidify the idea. Three to five is a really average rule of thumb, but whatever is enough to solidify the idea, that's how many you draw. Okay, so in this video, I want, I want to show you just the practice part of setting up partners. And I'm hoping you can be thinking, why would it be helpful to do a practice session first? And I'm just gonna tell you right now, three questions that I really love for setting up partners and just practicing what the partner routine looks like is, um, first one, tell your partner your favorite color, because everybody has one of those. Everybody can do that. Second, tell your partner your favorite animal. Again, really easy. Everybody can do this. And third, uh, tell your partner the name of someone in your family. Um, 
But those would be the questions I like to do in a practice session. And why do you do that first? I'll put up here a letter A and a letter B. That means if there's two of you, one of you will be the A, one of you will be the B. If there's three of you, I'm going to come back to you in a minute. I'll talk to the three parts in a second. Um, but here's how it works. Bracken and Alexa, to see how you guys are sitting here. And Bracken, you're sitting on the side where the A would be. Alexa, you're sitting on the side where the B would be. That means Bracken's A, Alexa is B. Okay. No, I'm not going to ask yet. I'm going to just go like this and show you. Underneath here, I'm going to write A, B, C. This is for those of you that are in a group of three. Um, let's see. Oh, we are both sitting so quietly. I'll start with my boys. Kaysen, see how you're sitting on this end where the A is? You're the A. B. C. Okay. Lillian, you're... Okay. Wow, I think I need to add a point for doing partners so quickly. Here's how this part works. This is the part that's kind of confusing to kids. Wherever the magnet is, that shows who gets to start. Yes. So if I, uh-oh, I'm going to actually move it to bees and have the bees try it in a second because I need it quiet so I can explain this. Wherever the magnet is, that person gets to start. As soon as that person is done, the other person gets to go. You're not going to hear me say, okay, letter A's, stop, stop, you're done, your turn is over, now it's letter B's turn. <laughs> I won't do that. As soon as the A is done, the B will go. Let me see who heard that. As soon as the A is done, the, the B, B will, will go. go. For ABCs, as soon as the A is done, then the B will go, then the C will go. Do you see how that works? Okay. When you're all the way done talking to your partner, I want you to turn back forward and sit kind of the way Adelie is sitting right now. Do you see how she's looking at me and her hands are on top of her desk? That would tell me that she was all done talking to her partner. Except that, guess what? You might not finish talking to your partner before I want you to finish. So if you hear me say, time's up in three, two, one, and done, that means you have to stop talking even if you're not done. And then I'll draw a stick, and if that person was sitting quietly, they would get to tell us what they said. Ethan? Oh, I'll tell you what to talk about. Actually, let's do a little practice. Could we just try a practice and see how you do? Because point if you know who your partner is. Without talking, you'll just point. Good. Some kids are going like this, having three. Okay, you can put your hands back. Ooh, super fast. Connor, Kaysen, Shavi, you'll just put your hands back. And uh, I'm going to say, I want you to tell your partner, oh, I almost forgot. You have to do it in a quiet voice so other people don't take your answer. That's the other important part. Remy, no shouting. Of course, he wouldn't shout. I'm just teasing him. OK, ready? I want you to tell your partner what your favorite animal is. Letter Bs go first. Go. Benj must be done because he's turning back forward. Presley Layton must be done because they're turning back forward. Ethan Layton, you too. London, you too. Okay, time's up in three, two, one, and done. If I draw your stick and you are sitting politely, sitting quietly with hands on top of your desk, will you tell us what your favorite animal is? Benj. What'd you say? Just tell me one. A cheetah. Okay. If this person is sitting ready, my not, uh oh. I'm only drawing sticks for kids that are sitting quietly. My next stick says. Okay. So probably you realized it's because any skill acquisition requires practice, right? If I want to create those neural pathways in the brain, I have to practice it. And my Target in this case is what does partner talk look like as a routine? So that's why I do a practice with the easy questions is to just get that skill acquisition of the partner talk routine. But in the next video, I want to show you partner talk in an actual lesson. And I'm hoping you can notice how all the partner talk components are in place to make this interaction more successful. So you'll notice there's an open-ended question. Kids are assigned 
who goes first without being told when to switch. The kids are going to use low voices. They will show a weird unsignal. Uh, I will give them a your done signal. And then we will draw sticks to share out. So would you watch what that looks like in an actual lesson? My turn first. I want you to echo me and you're going to notice there are some things the same about each of these words. In a second, I'll have you tell what you think is the same about these words. My turn first. Off. Off. Stuff. Stuff. Sniff. Sniff. Good. Phil. Phil. Shell. Shell. Doll. Doll. Pass. Pass. Boss. Boss. Less. Less. What did you notice was the same in off stuff? Sniff, fill, shell, doll, pass, boss, less. Were there some things you noticed the same about those words, about the letters in those words? Um, you're only allowed to say one thing at a time that you might have noticed because then it will be your partner's turn. But if you notice something, do it quietly so others don't take your answers. Letter B's, tell your partners. Letter A's for my groups of three. Go. Okay, time's up in three, two, one, and done. If this person is sitting quietly, will you tell us one thing you notice the same about these words? Tell me one thing, Alexa. They're at the end. Okay. Uh, what was at the end? What do you mean they're at the end? Okay, so the two letters at, at the end were the same? Okay, let's check it. Will you do it with her starting F, F, ready? F, 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 F. Those all came at the end. Can we check the next column? L, 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 L. Right with me. Last column, ready? S, 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 S. Ooh, okay. So they all had two letters the same at the end. Okay, if I draw your stick, tell me, do you notice something else the same about these words? Cole? Actually, Cole, I already drew your stick. Sorry, I didn't, I should have kept it out. Let me draw a stick for someone who hasn't had a turn. Thanks. Something else the same, Maddie? You think there's a short vowel in front of the two consonants. Ooh, could we check it? Stretch the O, oh, James, set your paper down. And put your arms all the way on top of your desk. Thank you. Stretch the O in off. Ready? Ah, ah, ah. And stuff? Stuff, ah, ah. Coraline, did you know that was a breathe? Is that why you're doing that? Sniff? Sniff, eh, eh. Okay, those all had short vowels. Ooh. Okay, so they all had short vowels. There was one other thing the same about each of them that I'm not sure I heard anyone say, but I want to see if anyone knows. If I draw your stick, will you tell me what you said? Layton? Um. Let me give you a clue. Are you ready? Here's your clue. There's one clap. There's one clap, or we could say there's one syllable. syllable. Yes. Okay, let's check it. Off. Off. Stuff. Stuff. Sniff. Those all had one. Fill. Fill. Shell. Shell. Doll. Doll. Doing it with us. Those all had one. Pass. Pass. Boss. Boss. Less. Less. Ding, ding, ding. They all had one. Syllable. Some kids knew it. You can put your hands down. Okay. So hopefully you notice those components. I have found that it's difficult to keep track of those when you first start using Partner Talk. So I put this checklist at the end of the guided notes. Remember, those are at lead2teach.com. If you want to print this out, it's a Partner Talk checklist so that you can say, am I hitting each of these really important components? Okay, last question as always. What did you like or learn about using partners in the classroom? What did you say? Uh, for me, it's this idea that everyone can do everything in the most meaningful oral language context possible when I'm willing to use partner talk, when I'm willing to take my engage engagement from choral responding only to partner talk. That's when I'm really going to see some rich discussion, some rich extension of ideas and deepening of student understanding. It's really fun. Okay, thanks for watching. Bye.